Before I start my talk, you may want to read this quotation of Einstein, which is translated in, it's one of his last written statements known. It was in German, it's translated from, by three people into English, we checked, cross-checked and uh, I'm very happy to introduce our third speaker today, Friedrich Heil. Uh, Friedrich has joint appointments at the University of Cologne and the University of Missouri, Columbia. He's done work on metric affine gra uh, gravity, general relativity with spin and torsion, short range confining uh, couplings in quadratic Poincare gauge theory. And in particular, Friedrich has the, I think, the unique distinction among the speakers of being the only one to have collaborated with Yuval. So he's very, very appropriate that he's speaking here today. His topic is violation of Lorentz invariance, non-metricity, and metric affine gravity. Dr. Heil. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. <clears throat> Well, it's my pleasure here to talk on the occasion of Uwai's 80th birthday. <clears throat> so this lecture is dedicated uh, to Yuval in gratitude. I had the opportunity to collaborate with Yuval for several times here at this great university. We collaborated in Austin, Texas, where uh, Yuval had been, or still is, a professor emeritus, I believe, and in Bursa Irvet in Cologne, and even we collaborated reading some proofs in his office in the Knesset. Uh, so he was always active and meeting him in his hotel in Jerusalem when he was a member of the Knesset. So I uh, have contact with Yuval. I just uh, computed it today 20, for 28 years and I think we have nine, nine joint papers. Well, I'm grateful uh, for the invitation to Aaron Levy and the organizers. The literature of my talk you can take from this preprint, which is an Erich lecture. And uh, this, on this topic, I'm presently collaborating mainly with, with Yuri Obukov, Cologne, Moscow, and with uh, Jakob Itin from Jerusalem, who is also here, I guess. <coughs> So after this introduction, of course, as all the people said, I mean, it's, it's always a pleasure to collaborate with Yuval. He has great ideas, he's open for discussions, and so I enjoyed this collaboration very much. In particular, I learned very much from Yuval. Now, uh, what has not been said so far is that there will be collected uh, works of, uh, or a reprint, a reprints of, of Yuval, which will be published in, uh, uh, with uh, World Scientific, editor is Ruffini and Verbin, and there are different chapters in this book, and I'm basically talking about one chapter of the book about metric affine gravity, and uh, some other catchwords which uh, became popular recently, but which is contained already in this work. So uh, this will come out pretty soon. Uh, uh, Josef told me that it's already with the publisher and only the preface is missing. So first I would like, like uh, François Auchler to start with Newton gravity, with Newton-Einstein gravity, weak Newton-Einstein gravity as I would call it, uh, and translational gauge theory. Then for the general public, because Aharon told me that it's believed to be of a colloquium type, not of a seminar type. I will talk about the building blocks of space-time of a general relativistic field theory. And there are three basic building blocks. Um, the the co-frame, 
the connection and the metric. Then I will talk about the teleparallel equivalent of general relativity, uh, GR teleparallel, which uh, uh, Jakob Itin is working on, for instance, recently. And from that, I turn to a Poincare gauge theory. That means the gauging of the Poincare group, or the in inhomogeneous Lorentz group, uh, also known under this name. And this brings in new types of strong young mills type gravity. Then I will speak about the simplest Poincare gauge theory you can think of. And this is what is now in the trade called einstein cartan theory, which was first finally formulated by Schirma and Kippe, 61. <clears throat> and this is a viable gravitational theory, general relativity plus an additional spin-spin contact interaction. And then I will go to discuss somewhat how one can measure torsion, because a, a quantity is, uh, is always uh, is only good if you can measure it and operationally verify that the quantity has a non-zero value in physics. And up to here, I think these are more or less established results, which are basically 20 years old, more or less. I mean, there's n uh, nothing didn't come uh, to that with exception of this multi-spinners of Uvi, which were also worked out with George Shiatsky, who is here with us. I will uh, shortly touch this in one of the chapters. Then I will turn to quadratic models of the Poincaré gauge theory and of metric affine gravity. I will present a generic, an exact solution of metric affine gravity, better to say a generic vacuum solution, but it's an exact solution, just as an example. And then my last paper, which I co-authored with Yuval, was on test matter in a space with a non-metricity, because you have to know how to get hold of this non-metricity of space-time. And that is what we thought over, and we published in 1997. So this, unfortunately, was the last paper which we wrote together. Well, hopefully, we will write uh, some other papers in future. <clears throat> well, uh, first, I want also to start like Francois, but not with such nice pictures as you have. I just have words to offer. Uh, what I, uh, well, uh, if you take, I mean, all people in this room can probably um, would agree on that the source of gravity is the mass. I mean, that's what we know from, from Newton's theory. And if you know special relativity, you know mass is no longer conserved. Mass in Newton's theory is conserved as experimentally verified by uh, Lavoisier around 1790, shortly before he was executed. <clears throat> and uh, mass is no longer conserved in special relativity. Special relativity is a theory of space-time where you can neglect gravity. If you are, have reasons, uh, to be able to neglect gravity, then you are in, in Minkowski's flat space-time of special relativity. And in this flat space-time of special relativity, mass is not conserved, but energy is conserved. And instead of the mass density, the quantity which is uh, responsible for the bookkeeping of energy momentum is the energy momentum tensor. So, like you know that in Newton's theory, mass is the source of gravity. In special relativity, you know even, so that's a theory which neglects gravity, but the source of gravity, which has to be introduced, is the energy uh, momentum tensor, is the source of gravity. And this gravitational field, which is connected to the energy momentum tensor, we call weak Einstein-Newton type gravity, because this is the same type, one over R potential, if you are far enough uh, from the source. So in, uh, if you have an isolated system, for instance, a matter field, consider a Dirac electron, for instance, then this isolated system is translationally invariant. Translations in time and translations in three directions of space. So you have a conserved energy momentum tensor. And uh, so the source of gravity is a conserved current. It's the conserved energy momentum current. And by Noether's theorem, we know that 
en energy momentum conservation is a consequence of translational invariance. And in special relativity, you know what a translational invariance means. So the source of gravity is a conserved current, and the corresponding symmetry is translational invariance. And that is underlying the source of gravity. OK, so you have the conserved energy. I, I call this capital sigma. Uh, for experts, this is the canonical energy momentum tensor. Alpha is numbering 0, 1, 2, 3. Num uh, 0 is energy. 1, 2, 3 are the three components of the uh, momentum. And this is a divergence. Divergence of this energy momentum tensor is equal to zero. OK, now I want to apply gauge ideas to gravity. And I think it's a safe thing to go back to Yang Mills and read what he uh, tells us about uh, gauging and not uh, going uh, immediately to fiber bundles or something, but really looking what the master has to tell. A definition of a gauge theory. We just have to study the title of this uh, uh, paper of Young, Young and Mills. Conservation of isotopic spin, nowadays we usually say isospin, and isotopic gauge invariance. That's now SU2 rigid uh, phase transformations. So already in the title it becomes clear at the basis of a gauge theory there is a conserved current and there is a symmetry. And this symmetry is uh, uh, related to the conservation of this current. Of course, as you all know, isotopic spin is uh, not strictly conserved. It's broken by um, electromagnetism, but this is not relevant for our purpose uh, here. <coughs> so what you are doing is you start uh, with, a, uh, with a conserved current and a, cons uh, a corresponding rigid symmetry. Rigid means that you apply this symmetry at all points of space-time with the same parameter. So it's a constant parameter all over space-time. And then you postulate that this rigid symmetry should be also locally valid. So it's an extension, of course. First, you have a rigid symmetry. And now you tell, well, let's assume this is locally invariant. Why do you uh, uh, assume that? Be because of hand waving and causality reasons. Because how can you implement a constant phase transformation all over space time at all space points at all times? This is not possible. So you better switch to a local transformation. OK? And that is. We postulate that the symmetry is, uh, is uh, assumed to be locally valid. And in order to achieve this, that's what Young Mills and in, for, for the U1 group, Weil, 1921, uh, has shown that we have to introduce so called gauge potentials, covectors carrying spin one, have to be newly introduced. In physics parlance, the intermediate vector bosons, which couple to the conserved current and are suitable to describe elementary interactions, interactions. So this, these new gauge potentials have a certain relation to the conserved current you started uh, your physics with. Now I adapted here. The diagram from Bob Mills <coughs> it was published in the American Journal of Physics, but I changed it a bit, which repeats what I have said, more or less. You have here, <coughs> you have a Lagrangian, which depends on the metal field, say the electron wave function on the first derivative of it. You have a rigid symmetry. In the case of the electron, it's uh, the U1 symmetry. In the case of a of proton neutron wave function in the sense of isotopic spin, um, it's, it's, of course, SU2. U1 is, of course, abelian, SU2 non-abelian, so you get some differences. Now you, uh, and you know that by Noether's theorem, this Lagrangian with, with the rigid symmetry uh, 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 yields a conserved current, which, which is defined here. Now you, uh, this is Noether's theorem, now you postulate local gauge invariance, you have to introduce 
um, vector or covector potentials for each generator of the uh, transformation, you have to introduce one potential. So in electrodynamics, you have one charge, you have to introduce one potential. If you have the translation group, you have four charges, you have to introduce four potentials. If you have the Lorentz group, which has six, six parameters, you have to introduce six uh, potentials. <coughs> and, and then you introduce that into the you, uh, you have to substitute the partial derivative by a covariant, gauge covariant derivative. That's a standard procedure. And then also this current, if it's non-abelian, well, it couples to this charge, uh, this current, uh, this uh, potential couples to the uh, current J. And uh, also this uh, conservation law is a bit changed. Instead of a, a exterior, have an exterior gauge covariant uh, derivative. <coughs> This is the logical pattern of a gauge theory now for the Dirac electron. I sketched it here. Uh, you, you start just with the Dirac equation, with the Dirac Lagrangian, with the wave function psi, i squared is minus 1. You have the Dirac matrices. The Dirac current is proportional to psi bar psi. And here the Dirac. Uh, uh, matrices sandwiched in, and this current is conserved. You have a, uh, the Lagrangian is invariant under this uh, rigid uh, transformation, so the Lagrangian is invariant. Now you make this function phi a function of x, and then of course uh, the metal Lagrangian is no longer invariant, and you have to uh, to do something, and this is what we already said. You have to um, substitute uh, the uh, partial derivative by the gauge covariant derivative, that's partial derivative plus I, the image on the unit electric charge times IA. This is a covector. And uh, so the uh, metal Lagrangian is substituted here, this partial derivative by this covariant uh, derivative. And also important is that these uh, gauge potentials, if you make such a a local phase transformation uh, behave in a certain way, uh, just the gradient of phi is added to A. This is because uh, of this phase transformation, uh, because of this first derivative in the Lagrangian. You have to require this transformation of A in order to make this a covariant statement. So you've got this covector which has four independent components for in the case of electricity because you have charge conservation with one parameter in the uh, uh, corresponding U1 group. <clears throat> so you have one potential, it has four components, one covector has four. Uh, so now, because you can transform A in this way, it is only non-trivial if its curl is non-vanishing. Because if its curl is vanishing, you can always transform it away. So the curl is a, that this is non-vanishing is a criterion for the non-triviality of the gauge potential which you introduced. So you uh, take the field strength is the curl of A written in components. Fij is equal partial di aj minus uh, anti-symmetric uh, in J and I. And you can immediately see that the field strength is anti-symmetric, so you have only six independent components. So no, you have now, from the gauge procedure, starting with the interaction-free Dirac field, you have derived by the gauge proce procedure the vector potential, the field strength of electromagnetism. You have the, uh, the field strength is necessary in order to have it non-trivial. If you square the field strength, you can add it to the original Lagrangian here, and then we get Dirac-Maxwell theory. So you derive sort of the Maxwell part from the Dirac part and the symmetry principle. So before you had no electromagnetic interaction, after you have applied this procedure, you have uh, interaction. And this is what we are now going to do for gravity. Now, we know that what Young Mills told us, we have to start with a conserved current. This is the energy momentum current, um, which um, uh, energy momentum current and uh, now we make trans uh, in, the, in, low, in uh, Minkowski space time, where we start with, we make the translations local. 
And for that reason, because we have four generators of translations, we need four gauge potentials. Let me call this gauge potential theta. Theta alpha, alpha is running from zero to four. Zero is the potential of the energy, one, two, three, the potential for the momenta or the components of the momentum, of the three momentum. And, uh, and the potential is always a, a one form, so it has four indices here. So altogether you have 16 components. And this, uh, as we shortly see, is the tetrad couples to the conserved current, like J in Dirac's theory couples to the um, potential. And the Lagrangian is just J times, uh, uh, times uh, A. And here it's theta times uh, the energy momentum. If you interpret these potentials geometrically, then you find out there are the duals of the tetra field of space-time. This was a quite long discussion. I will give some names in the next page. So at each point of space-time, in four dimensions, you have a, a, a field bind or a tetra uh, four leg, so to say. And uh, this is, uh, can be interpreted as the potentials of translations. And now by the same rule which we had before, how do we know that these potentials are trivial or not trivial? We take the curl of these potentials. This curl is called torsion, Cartan's torsion. We call it T. And you take the curl, there will be some supplementary terms. And it will be anti-symmetric in these indices. So altogether you have four generators times six field strengths, 24 components altogether. So the torsion is the field strength which belongs to the translations. Uh, so it, in that sense, it's a very important quantity. And what I now want to try to do is to, for a moment, go back to pure geometry and to try to introduce the, the building blocks, the basic building blocks which we need in geometry for describing a space-time, at least a re of relativistic sp uh, space-time. I don't talk about non-commutative geometries or higher dimensions, just ordinary four-dimensional general relativistic type of space-time. So these building blocks, the first building block is the co-frame. We just talked about this. <coughs> so you have... Um, I'm not sure whether this is in focus exactly. It's, it's here. No, I'm not sure. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Now you have, um, if you would take an arbitrary point of space time, you have three coordinate lines. I, I uh, uh, sketched that in three dimensions. Here, x1, x2, x3. And then at each point you have three uh, uh, vectors, the tangent vectors to these coordinate lines, which I call E1, E2, E3. Uh, in, um, and dual to these vectors, you have what is called covectors. Covectors are always uh, like, I mean, uh, potential, um, uh, symbolized by two parallel lines and sort of the distance of these planes uh, tells you about the strength of the covector and to have a, to have a direction. Now I couldn't uh, uh, draw this here, so this is the point P, and this is the co-vector and the co-frame theta 1, which is dual to this vector E1, and you have to attach this to this point. And this E3 is dual to E3, and theta 2 is dual to E2. Uh, e2. So the, you have at each point of space-time uh, four vectors and four covectors, and they are dual to each other. From the point of view of gauge theory, you want the covectors because potentials are always covectors. Uh, so if you prefer the covectors. You could uh, develop a formalism which is um, um, corresponding for formalism for vectors, but it's not worthwhile to, these, uh, to do so. So if you go, this is what is in the trait called a natural frame because it can be naturally built up from the coordinates. Uh, yeah, now you can make a linear combination of this natural frame and you get what is called an arbitrary frame in, the, uh, in geometry. It's often called the moving frame. It has different names, goes back to Darbu and other people. <coughs> okay, so this uh, linear combination 
of theta alpha can always be decomposed in components. These are 4, 1 forms, so you get these 16 coefficients at each uh, point of space-time. Uh, the discussion of this translational potential and whether this is a, um, the transformation behavior you have to expect for a potential, etc., is, uh, well, there's a long discussion, and, but I think it's now pretty clear what's happening. Hayashi Nakano, Joe Yuval has a paper on that, Nietzsche, other people, and in particular recently, uh, Etin and, and Kaniel have uh, papers on, on um, uh, teleparallelism theories or frame theories. Uh, co-frame gravity, I think, uh, Jakob Paulsi, Obukov and Pereira, Delfenich, in the book of Ortin, the new book, Gravity Engaged, you find some discussion of that. Uh, so, uh, this is the first building block of space-time. I think as soon as you accept the manifold picture that, uh, or the continuum picture of space-time, uh, this is sort of a necessary uh, tool uh, to, to have a co-frame at each point. You cannot do much about this. Uh, it, it arises naturally. And the second uh, structure which also arises naturally and which is in incidentally a gauge structure as we will see because it's connected with the linear group. It's the potentials of the linear group is the, affine con uh, the linear connection, formerly called affine connection. There are still some people call it affine connection, but this affine connection in the geometrical sense of Kobayashi no, no Mitsu, this is a more general structure which I will not discuss here. So you have a, uh, a linear connection is given and a, a linear, I gave this quotation of Einstein, which he wrote shortly before his passing away, as far as, as far as I'm aware. This is the last written document uh, of Einstein. It appeared in a book, in an in Italian book on uh, celebrating uh, relativity theory in 1955. Um, and uh, uh, I just, he can express it better than I can do. It is the directly relevant conceptual element is a displacement field uh, which expresses the infinitesimal displacement of vectors. It's this which replaces the parallelly, uh, parallelism of spatially arbitrary separated vectors fixed by an inertial frame, etc. So the idea is that um, if, if you want to make physics on a manifold, you need more than a co-frame. The metric you don't really need. What you need is a rule for parallel transfer of spinner or vector and tensors. So the parallel transfer is the underlying uh, structure which was recognized by, by Ricci and, and Levi Civita and, and other people. Um, and this linear connection connects one point with a neighboring point. And if you want to say a scalar is constant on a manifold, you can say it because a gradient of a scalar is a covariant quantity. If you want to tell a vector is a constant quantity all over space-time, you cannot unless you introduce a connection. So you have to specify at each point of space-time a connection, and this connection allows you to parallel transfer a vector and then to compare it with a vector which is actually at this point of space-time. This is a concept of a linear connection. It connects one space, uh, point of space-time with a neighboring one. And uh, of course, you can parallelly transfer in four dimensions in four directions. And, and a vector typically has, of course, four components. And the rule then is uh, that a vector C, beta, has four different components is parallel transferred, then it uh, changes linearly homogeneously. It's uh, gamma alpha, beta alpha, and beta run from zero to three, so-called and holonomic indices, and this gamma um, are just uh, four times four, 16 potentials, uh, which each of it has four components. So you have um, uh, 16 times four, 64 components of, an, of a linear connection. 
Incidentally, at this point, the symmetry of the current collection is even not a question which you can po uh, pose uh, sensibly. It's, it's, it's a 64 in the back. And you can easily see it's the potential of the GL4R, the general four dimensional linear group. If you sort of, you can uh, trans uh, define your frame and can define arbitrary linear transformations, non-degenerate uh, linear transformations. And so at each point you have this group automatically with a tetrad, you have also this group. And the connection can be understood as a, um, a potential, uh, a Yang-Mills potential of the linear group. Um, and this is very similar to the Yang-Mills potential uh, this is what I wrote here of the SU3. If you look at U61 paper, you can see these uh, uh, potentials at work. And of course, as usual, we have a potential. We apply a curl in order to extract its non-trivial um, part. And you get a curl is, uh, of this potential is a curvature. And uh, since by pure counting, you can see that these are um, um, 6 times 16, uh, 96 uh, independent components. Um, and uh, this is the curl of the potential. You have a nonlinear term here. And this um, field strength of uh, the linear group is, of course, anti symmetric in I and J again. And so you have here these uh, relations. <coughs> So now we have um, the field strength of the linear group. And the next slide is to make my definitions a bit more watertight. If, I, if you write the torsion two form in components, this is what I did here, and the curvature two form in components, then there are field strengths. Symbolically, in exterior calculus, T is a derivative of theta plus gamma wedge theta. R is derivative of gamma minus gamma wedge gamma. So these are the field strengths of the gauge theory of the affine group. The, um, translate, uh, the affine group is a semi-direct product of the translations with the linear transformations. And the translational potentials enter here, and the linear potential enter here, but they also enter here. And this is a very remarkable structure that the linear potentials enter in the field strength of the translation. This is a result of the semi-direct product structure of, 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 of this group. Uh, sort of uh, the uh, translations and, and uh, the linear group is this sort of this semi-direct product structure means that the generators of the linear transformations and the translations don't commute. And because of this, uh, you get this uh, sort of term. So you, you see curvature and torsion are, in a, in a, uh, are linked. And you cannot get rid of this link because of this term. And this is a term which makes a lot of trouble in interpretation to some people. Uh, the interpretation of the torsion, let me just uh, remind you shortly. If you have here a vector which uh, um, uh, connects two neighboring points, and here another one with a neighboring point. Now you tra parallelly transfer this vector to this point. You get V parallel here. You parallelly transfer this vector to this point. You get U R parallel. And then the torsion is this uh, small vector. You get the closure failure of a parallelogram. So torsion can be, or is uh, the closure, can be interpreted as a closure failure of parallelograms, and as such, it enters, uh, for instance, in dislocation theory. <laughs> OK, now let me uh, come to the, uh, to the third building block of a relativistic field theory. This is the metric of space-time. Now, experience tells us that we need more than a, met uh, more than a, co a, a connection because we want uh, to measure time and space intervals and angles. So we need a pseudo Riemannian or Lorentzian metric GIJ, which most of you would know, which is a metric tensor field of space time with 10 independent components. If G alpha beta are the components with respect to a coframe, um, <coughs> then uh, 
uh, the co uh, components with respect to a coordinate frame are given by this transformation rule. This is g alpha beta, and these are the coefficients of the tetrad, and this gives you the metric in what is called holonomic coordinates. Generally, you can write the metric is g alpha beta times theta alpha tensor product with uh, c, uh, theta beta. And of course, in the four-dimensional space-time of special uh, and general relativity with respect to an orthonormal basis, we have this well-known form of the metric. Now, I, I shortly want to touch, because this is one of the things which we investigated in the last couple of years. Uh, this uh, metric we can show is no longer to be considered to be a fundamental field. Metric can really be derived from electrodynamics. Um, well, one of the forerunners was Perez, there's Tupin, Schoenberg, Obukov, Rubila, and myself. The metric is an electromagnetic animal. It's not a fundamental field. I just want to make a few remarks about that. I cannot really go into details. We call, it's called pre-metric electrodynamics. We have written a book about that. Foundations of Classical Electrodynamics. There are also books uh, in the same spirit by Post 62, by Kovetz. He should be around here somewhere. He has written a very beautiful uh, textbook about electrodynamics, which is written very much in this spirit. And Lindell, Ismo Lindell, a book on, on, on the same subject. What is it? You derive electrodynamics from, from conservation laws. So the conservation law of, of uh, charge yields the inhomogeneous Maxwell equation. This capital H is an abbreviation, for, it is four dimensional for the H and the D field. You, from magnetic flux conservation, you get DF equals zero. F uh, stands for the electric and the magnetic field for E and B. And this uh, formulation of Maxwell's equation is independent of any metric, of any connection. It's valid on a differential manifold. All you have to be able is to, to split this manifold in space and time. So this is a very general, uh, general, so I mean, this form of Maxwell's equation has nothing to do whatsoever with special relativity of the Poincare group. This is just a generally covariant statement which is valid in any space time. Now, you have, of course, this is an incomplete system. You have to do something. So what you have to do, uh, you have to introduce a space-time relation. I think Kovitz calls it, uh, following Tupin and Trustel, uh, ether relation. You have to relate F and H. And the simplest thing you can do is to take a local and linear law. Since H is a two-form and F is a two-form, this kappa has, uh, carries 36 independent components. Now you have a complete system. You have the Maxwell equations generally covariant. You have a constitutive law for the vacuum, which is also uh, um, um, generally covariant. Nowhere is anything connected with the Poincare group or anything. So it's, it's wrong to, to assume. I mean, historically, um, the development of special relativity is closely linked to Maxwell's theory and of course so most people think that Maxwell's theory is closely linked to, uh, to special relativity. This is not true. <coughs> okay, um, and then you have these uh, Maxwell equations and this constitutive law and then you can study the propagation of electromagnetic disturbances with a method of Adama. It's what we used so you study a propagation of electromagnetic waves. You take the geometrical optic limits. And then what you find is that the light propagates in, at a quartic surface of order four, not of order two. So you get a sort of a, uh, like in a crystal, uh, it's really called a Kummer Fresnel surface. And this is a fourth order, a quartic surface. And only under special conditions, if you forbid by refringence in vacuum, this quartic surface breaks down into a, a quadratic of a quadratic surface. And this is the light cone. And, and the light cone determines the metric up to a conformal factor. So you have derived the metric from um, electromagnetism by assuming a local and linear constitutive law for the vacuum. So by very simple assumptions and by forbidding by refringence in vacuum. But it's uh, very 
interesting because you don't need then the well you only need to postulate electromagnetism and this linear local and linear law and forbid by refringence then you can derive the metric. So in that sense the metric is a derived concept and the light cone is really what the light cone is defined to be the propagation surface of, of a photon of light. Nowadays, when no other particle than the photon has rest mass zero, light is the only way you can really recognize what's called the light cone. Uh, so this is a picture of Pirani and Schild. You have light cones at everywhere. It's a conformal structure. And if you parallelly transfer one light cone uh, to, to a neighboring, it will de be deformed by this uh, quantity which is called non-metricity, which I will discuss in a moment, and therefore you get certain violations of Lorentz transformations if you um, erect corresponding theories. This is sort of a repetition. We have then in our space-time, in our general relativistic space-time, we have three different potentials. We have the metric, which we introduced finally, which I from now on will consider to be fundamental, but uh, I already uh, told you that uh, this is not my real belief, the co-frame and the connection. And by differentiation, we get the field strength. If you differentiate the metric, you get what's called a non-metricity. This is a symmetric uh, one form, symmetric alpha, beta, second order, uh, tensor one form, tensor valued uh, one form, strict, uh, strictly speaking, the torsion by covariant differentiation of the co-frame and the curvature by covariant differentiation of the connection. So you have three types of uh, potentials, you have three types of Field strengths, of course, we know in Einstein's theory this and this is zero, non-metricity and torsion is zero, and what is left is only this curvature. But also in Einstein, you have all these three structures. Of course, in Einstein's theory, this connection is reduced to the Christoffel symbol. So you recover Einstein's theory. By. And the currents which cover to this potential, we also know, this is a, um, which is the symmetric energy momentum coupled to the metric. This is the Hilbert energy momentum tensor. This one is a canonical or neutral energy momentum tensor coupled to the theta. And here is a current which couples to the connection, which we call hypermomentum current. And this hypermomentum current splits into the well-known spin current, the dilation current, which is also well-known, and what is called the shear current. This is a current related to the S um, uh, special linear four-dimensional real group. And this is uh, one was our first uh, work together to relate this uh, to earlier work of Dotan, Gelman, and Neyman. Uh, so we have this irreducible decomposition of the hypermomentum current in a spin current, a dilation current, and a shear current. And the spin current is anti-symmetric. And a theory which is spent by these, uh, by these geometrical uh, inputs is called a metric affine uh, well, space and the corresponding uh, gravitational theory you call metric affine uh, gravity. Now, this theory has a bosonic part or a tensorial part which was mainly developed by my group in Cologne. But the fermionic version um, where you introduce spinors was uh, developed by Yuval together with uh, George uh, Shiatsky, who is also here in, in the audience. Because you don't have finite dimensional spinor rep representation of the linear group. We learned that uh, in, in general, this curvature uh, belongs to the linear group. In the linear group, you have no finite dimensional spinor representations, and you have to introduce what Yuval introduced, what is called a world spinor, which has infinite many components, and you have uh, sort of to generalize the Dirac equation uh, in order to accommodate this type of matter. And this is uh, related to, to rigid trajectories, and uh, I uh, will just mention this at, at this place. So you have each current is coupled to a potential exactly as it should be, and each potential has a field strength uh, exactly as it should be. A very short, uh, let me just uh, put in this uh, 
the floor characterizing in a space. Uh, suppose you are in a Euclidean space. You take a vector a u and a vector v, and you parallelly transfer it around a small closed circuit. You come back, the vector u coincides with the original vector, the vector v coincides with the original vector. So if you consider it to be a, a triangle, this triangle is just uh, moved into itself. If you have a riemann cartan space, this triangle is just rotated with respect to the original triangle before you. If you have a, um, a weil cartan space, then you get an additional, um, this is in yellow, an additional factor. So it's, it's simi similar to the uh, original triangle. It's no longer congruence, but it's, it's similarity, which, which counts. And if you go to a metric affine space time, this is this uh, uh, king or whatever it is. Uh, you get a linear deformation of this triangle, which you started with. And uh, incidentally, Weil's unified field theory was in this uh, uh, yellow uh, domain. Uh, and now uh, let us uh, uh, now this teleparallel equivalent. I think. I will be rather short on that because this goes like in Maxwell's theory. Uh, if you have now a translational gauge theory, you want to set up um, the inhomogeneous Maxwell type equation and a homogeneous one. And you can do that. You choose a Lagrangian, which is quadratic in the field strength um, of the um, translation. This is a torsion. And you can um, uh, get a, a torsion square Lagrangian. You find field equations divergence of the torsion plus nonlinear terms are proportional to energy momentum. If you substitute the definition of the torsion, you find here a wave operator applied uh, to the uh, uh, tetrad components plus nonlinear terms are proportional to the energy momentum tensor. These are the field equations of uh, uh, translational gauge theory. And you can easily see provided this energy momentum tensor is symmetric. If you write Einstein's equation, you can write them as uh, the d'Alembert operator applied to GIJ, the metric plus nonlinear terms is proportional to small sigma, uh, the symmetric energy momentum tensor. And you can show that for uh, as long as the uh, energy momentum tensor stays symmetric for scalar and for Maxwell, a matter of these theories are equivalent. So you recover Einstein's theory not as it is often stated in la literature as a, 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 a Lorentz gauge theory, it's a translational gauge theory. That's the message here. And the, if you count the number of, of potential and so on, as I have shown, uh, there is no doubt that this is the correct way of, go, uh, of thinking about uh, translational gauge theory and coming up and seeing that the translational gauge theory is equivalent to this uh, 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 to Einstein's theory. So, so that's a new way of arriving at Einstein's theory. But at the same time, it's a way where you can immediately see generalizations. Because we don't believe only in translational invariance. We believe in Poincare invariance or inhomogeneous Lorentz invariance. This is what we uh, know from spe uh, special relativity. So we cannot stop here. How do we go about this? Now, uh, let me just this. Uh, Translational gauge theory is um, sort of the habitat of this. Is, is a, what's called a Weizenberg space time. If you have a, um, a Riemann Cartan space time, the non metricity vanishes, you have only torsion and curvature. Then you can either put the curvature equal to zero, then you get what is called a Weizenberg space time. It has only torsion, and the translational gauge theory is formulated in this space. And if you put the torsion equal to zero, you get a Riemannian space of Einstein's theory. And you can show that these theories, are, uh, uh, provided uh, uh, we have scalar matter or Maxwell matter, uh, are equivalent to each other, of course. And then you finally get to Minkowski space time. So this is uh, this transitions of these different space times is sort of fairly well understood. <coughs> Now, of course, one wants to go uh, to a Poincaré gauge theory. Um, G parallel, the teleparallelism equivalent, is somewhat degenerate. 
So we extend translations uh, to precary transformations. Additional, well, the, of course we need, since we make an, a gauge theory, we need um, a new conservation law. A new conservation law is, of course, angular momentum conservation. <laughs> angular momentum conservation is that the divergence of spin plus orbital um, angular momentum is equal to zero. If you differentiate out, it's divergence of spin plus the anti-symmetric part of the energy momentum tensor is equal to zero. Spin is the intrinsic part of angular momentum. We need six Lorentz gauge potentials, a connection, which we discussed already. It's anti-symmetric in alpha and beta, since the spin is anti-symmetric in alpha and beta, which I pointed out here. We have six uh, spin currents. <coughs> Uh, this is called Poincaré gauge theory, but we can immediately, well, and it couples the, these potentials coupled to energy momentum, canonical energy momentum, and canonical spin tensors. And you get uh, 16 plus 24 second order field equations. And the simplest Lagrangian yields the Einstein Cartan theory, which we will discuss on the next page. We can generalize these 16 potentials by dropping the anti-symmetry to, um, uh, to, um, to the affine group from the translations to the total affine group. And then uh, we get what is called metric affine uh, gravity. In both cases, meaning per gauge, if you have anti-symmetric, uh, and if you have these new potentials, you get new hypothetical, what, what is called strong gravity a la Young-Mills, with a dimensionless coupling constant. Yang himself proposed such a theory, five minutes, okay, uh, in Fiesel Review letters, which you can uh, see here. Um, well, this name strong gravity was earlier called, in this context, the FG gravity tensor dominance models by Aisham, Salam, Strathy, Vesumino had such models, Reno, Chromo gravity was, uh, it was called by Neyman and Chiatsky. In any case, it's related to the hadronic stress tensor and to gravity uh, type fields are involved. So strong gravity can be very massive or massless depending on the Lagrangian. Of course, strong gravity is then the gauge bosons at, uh, which are linked to the linear group and they are like Young-Mills fields. They can either be massless, going to infinity, or very massive, and if they are massive, it's believed to be of the order of the Planck mass. But this is um, probably bigger, which I'm just going to tell you now. Uh, einstein cartan theory. If you now take the uh, Poincaré gauge theory, and to, you take the simplest Lagrangian possible, the generalization of the Hilbert Einstein Lagrangian, the curvature scalar of a Riemann Cartan space time, you get uh, what is called the Einstein Cartan theory. So the Ricci tensor, which is a contraction of the curvature tensor, is proportional to energy momentum. The torsion tensor is proportional to spin. These are the field equations 16 plus 24. Here, kappa is every, uh, Einstein's gravitational constant. It's important that both field equations go with the same coupling constant, with a normal gravitational constant. And if you work out the theory, you can find out that you get general relativity plus an additional spin contact interaction. And this uh, gravi uh, of gravitational origin. You, you find that this theory at very high mass density is at a critical mass, which is the mass of the particle divided by its Compton wave length times the Planck length square. And if you look at the densities, these are 10 to the 52 gram per cc or 10 to the 24 Kelvin. Uh, this is, uh, uh, of course, very high only in cosmological questions. It, uh, it may play a role. Uh, but all the predictions of this theory are otherwise um, the same as general relativity. In this sense, it's a viable theory. It's a gauge theory of gravity. It has an additional contact interaction. For Dirac particles, this contact interaction is repulsive. So it's a, a viable. Uh, people in the particle physics community, there's a PhD thesis at Desi and an article by Goy on Hera, Lepp, and Teratron looked for spin contact interactions in uh, high energy. Um, uh, proton-electron scattering, they didn't find anything 
but um, it's of course a question of the mass of the intermediate boson and uh, since uh, uh, you cannot predict this, uh, it's, well, you have just to look for experiments where you have such uh, contact interaction. Measuring torsion. Uh, <coughs> uh, if a, a torsion can be measured, as one can uh, prove by the precession of elementary particles which have spin. So um, you, this precession, if you have the uh, polarization vector of such a spin, uh, the ti uh, time derivative is torsion times this uh, precession vector. So you can, this is a torsion vector, and you can uh, look out for the numbers that uh, general relativity, the teleparallel equivalent, would have on the surface of the Earth a torsion of 10 to the minus 15, 1 over seconds, which is uh, uh, not what you can measure presently. Presen uh, you can uh, use graver types of experiment. So what you want is a gravity probe B, but instead of the quartz balls, which are rotating, you want a spin gyroscope. There are recently some papers on that, people now developing better uh, gyroscopes built up from spin, this paper of Cornac et al. Uh, so uh, you have an additional uh, precession of, an, say, a neutron in the gravitational field, which is proportional to, to spin and uh, this is uh, a way to measure torsion. <clears throat> and this is basically uh, this, what I said, these are solid results. What I'm now going uh, to discuss uh, in the last uh, minutes. Uh, if you go to quadratic models of Poincare gauge theory and metric affine gravity, then you have a Lagrangian, which is a Hilbert Einstein. Lagrangian scalar, a scalar curvature, cosmological term, torsion square, torsion times non-metricity, non-metricity square, and then the curvature of the Riemannian piece basically and of the non-Riemannian piece. This is a quadratic Lagrangian uh, which is very complicated and since each of these curvatures have uh, many independent irreducible components, you can only handle the very simple Lagrangian. This Q is the non-metricity, if it's unequal to zero, then the connection is no longer anti-symmetric, and you can decompose the curvature in its anti-symmetric part, which is called uh, the rotational curvature, and in its strain curvature, which is the symmetric part of the connection. If the non-metricity is zero, you get Poincaré gauge theory, otherwise you get metric affine gravity. For Poincaré gauge theory, ghost-free Lagrangians exist, which have been quantized by a couple of people. Um, metric affine generalization of Dirac spinners to world spinners, Kirsch and Shiatsky, of course, with Neyman. This is, you have a fermionic hyperfluid of Opukov and Trisgeres, which you can put on the right-hand side of these field equations and you have post riemannian cosmologies. I have just left now, um, wait a minute, I can just do with two, two slides, is that okay? Yeah. We're doing the end. Sorry? You're I'm over time already, okay, I'm sorry. So let me just, well, uh, so let me cut short. Sorry for over being over time. We, we, uh, I, we have found an exact solution of such a model with a quadratic Lagrangian, which has a, a nice metric, a nice connection, a nice non-metricity, and with this non-metricity we can describe Lorentz violations. And I just display now one equation which we discussed together with Neyman. Um, test matter and non-metricity. If you have test matter in a space time, metric affine space time, and you study um, energy conservation, you get divergence of the um, energy momentum tensor plus a hyper momentum times this non riemannian part of the connection, etc. And then you, these quantities is a twiddle are Riemannian quantities. So if this um, current, the hypermomentum current is vanishing, you just get back the geodesic equation of general relativity. And if you have this hypermomentum, this couples to the non Riemannian parts of, of the connection. So this equation is an exact derivation of this very complicated field theory. It, it's a very non trivial proof. But this shows you very clearly how you can 
uh, discuss non-metricity and we have shown that spin uh, is uh, measured by, um, uh, by precession and non-metricity by pulsations. So you have a test matter which uh, where quadrupole mass uh, excitations uh, can take place um, like if you go from a ratchet trajectory from one particle to the next one which has spin plus two and then I come to my last transparency which is only half a transparency so it's not so it's possible to compute the conserved charges of our exact solution. I just displayed one very simple solution, but which I didn't show. And, uh, um, and it has mass, spin, and orbital angular momentum, dilation charge, and shared charge. The shared charge is a measure for violating Lorentz invariance. Metric affine gravity provides straightforwardly consistent models for violating local Lorentz invariance by attributing the violation of Lorentz invariance to a geometrical property of space-time, namely to the non-metricity. So this message is that if you want to have a violation of Lorentz invariance, you better don't introduce ad hoc fields, but you take just a connection. And one piece of the connection is this non-metricity. And this is a tool for describing uh, it is one tool for describing uh, um, possible violations of Lorentz invariance, but a tool which is related to geometry of space-time. And since Lorentz symmetry is deeply uh, uh, related to, uh, to the geometry of space-time, I think this is probably the appropriate way to do it. Thank you very much for your caution. And, uh, <clears throat> and thank you very much, Yuba. Thank you very much. We have time maybe for one or two questions. We are a little bit over time, but let's have some questions if there are some. Yes. Could you uh, comment maybe? Uh, you thought that all the gauge fields are massless, but uh, can you imagine a kind of fixed gibble mechanism here? Yes. Uh, I mean, fields. I didn't say that all these fields are massless. Uh, they, are, um, they are massless, the translational gauge potentials, but the young mills, the strong type of gravity can be massive. There's no problem. They will be typically massive. But there is now a paper. There are some papers underway where this is discussed as a gravitational Higgs mechanism. There's a recent paper by Kirsch in the preprint server and uh, <coughs> So that can be massive. That's the answer. I think since the hour is late, we should have further discussion in, individually. And we will break now for, for lunch. We'll come back at 2.15, and the lunch is downstairs as yesterday. Thank you. Let's, thank you.